You just got to stay in the game. Come on, everybody say, stay in the game. Don't quit. Romans 8, 29 says that God has predestined his people to be conformed to his image. We've been in the book, we're going to be in the book of James. We're still in chapter one. I can't get through. I keep running into a good message. I just can't get through it. I, so just bear with me. We'll be there for the rest of the year, maybe. But it's all good. That whole book is good. Um, God desires that I transform, that I, actually that, that scripture says conform. That means that I'm supposed to change my shape to his shape. He, he desires that not just for the pastor, not just for the ministry leader, but for every believer that's listening to my voice right now, whether you're in here or live stream, he desires that you change, that you're conformed to his image, that you look like him, that you, you, just, you act like him, you talk like him, you walk like him. That's, his, that's, what he's, that's what we're doing this morning. Listen, I hope you didn't come in here today so that your spouse could be transformed. Well, pastor, he, he does need to be. Well, you do. Yeah, he does, but you do too. And I think that we'd get more out of church if we started showing up for ch to church for us. And, I, and, and stop showing up for everybody else. Stop bringing everybody because they need it. Can I help you? You need it. I need it. I need this word. I need to preach on Sunday because Monday through s till I get here on Sunday, God's transforming my life by reading that word with what I'm about to tell you. I've already been slapped uh, a thousand times before I get up here on Sunday by the Holy Ghost saying, you need to do that too. Come on, I've already repented and confessed 10 times before I get here because that word is alive and it separates my soul from my flesh every time I open it. That's why I always tell people, like, don't read somebody else's sermon. Go dig it out. Because in the digging out, it changes you. Maybe we're reading too many other sermons. Maybe we're regurgitating somebody else's revelation too much that, that there's no change in you because it wasn't you that dug it out. There's, something happens to you in the digging. Huh? So listen, you can be changed today by my digging. I'm not saying that, that, that you shouldn't come to church, hear a message, and be changed. But what about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? When are you digging? When do you dig for you? Or is it just Sunday? Well, Pastor Robert will dig. We'll get something good on Sunday. Half the time, you don't remember what I preached by the next Sunday. Come on, so anybody, some, I've had people come and tell me, hey, brother, that was so good. I was like, yeah, what part? <laughs> like, All of it was good. Uh, I'm on to you. I'm on to you. It was all so good. And he wants us to conform to his image. We, we, in James, I'm just going to recap real quick the last few Sundays. He said, the testing of my faith produces endurance. James 1, he says, the testing of my faith, so we can't run away from tests. Because it's in the test that I get stronger in my faith. And when that endurance go goes up, what happens to me is that endurance goes up, and I begin, the Bible says, I begin to perfect. But let me help you with something. It's not perfectionism. I begin to mature. That, that word perfect means to complete, to mature. So what God is saying is like, every time I test your faith, ha -ha, let, me, let, me, let me help you give you an example of testing the faith. Testing the faith is when, you're believe, when you stay believing for something that ain't happening. Some of y'all right now are in a test of faith. You're praying for people that haven't come to Christ yet. Are, are you with me? You're believing for your family to come. You're believing for your marriage. You're believing every time that you want to quit, but you make a decision to stay in faith, your, taste, your, te your faith is tested. And it's maturing you. You don't see it. It's hard to see maturation, but if you stay in it long enough, you'll mature. Then in the same chapter, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Who's willing to give it? But he says, I want you to be, be careful with something. He says, I want you to be careful with double-mindedness. 
I'm just recapping James chapter 1. So if you don't have wisdom and you need it, ask him for it. He'll give it to you, the Bible says, but I won't give it to you if you're double-minded. He says, don't, let not a double-minded man expect to receive anything from God. That's what the scripture says, James 1. What does double-minded mean? That means that one minute I'm in belief and one minute I'm out of belief. That means that one minute I'm living, that when I come to church on Sunday, I live a certain kind of way. And when I go home, I live a different kind of way. Come on, we're two, we're two different people. Are y'all all right? It's, it's, it's Sunday. It's, it'll get encouraging eventually. But the, he said, I want you to conform into my image. And these are some of the qualities and characteristics of God that, that don't run away from tests. I want to mature you. I'm looking to mature you. And, and listen, as you mature, ask me for wisdom and I'll give it to you. But live right. Don't be one foot in, one foot out. Don't straddle the fence. The, the only thing that can happen if you straddle the fence, man, is you get hurt. Not one foot in, one foot out, but both feet in. We also learned that the blessing is linked to my ability to endure temptation. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Are y'all remember that? Blessing comes in my ability to endure the temptation. What is endure the temptation is to not fall into the temptation. To be faced with temptation, temptation is not sin. Temptation is an opportunity. When that opportunity comes and you know it's not godly, when I choose to endure and resist it, I'm blessed. Blessing comes. This is, what the, the, this is what James is teaching the believers as he's writing this book. He's saying, here are the key components that I want you to have. I want you to understand that I don't want you to avoid temptation. I don't want you to run from temptation. I want you to be able to endure it eventually. Now, when you're first faced with it, you might have to run. Joseph ran. But you can't spend your whole life running. You can't spend your whole life in recovery. Eventually, you got to recover. It's a miserable existence to just be in recovery all your life. But there's a place for it. But God is setting you up to recover. Because it's the recovered people that can get up on a platform and say, I used to be you. And you don't have to live that way no more. And you don't have to be like that anymore. And listen, if God will do it for me, he'll do it for you. But there's a price. There's a price. Listen, nobody wants to, everybody wants the free gift of God, which is grace and salvation. But nobody wants the price of lordship. There's, he's Lord and Savior. Savior takes nothing. Savior's free to you. He becomes your Savior when you put your faith into him. But he becomes your King when he becomes your Lord. Amen. And Lordship is my decision. Who do I crown? And we crown you. We fall face down and we worship. Who are you crowning? Most of us crown our sin. That's all we think about. We got to crown the king. Amen. <clears throat> James 1, 19 through 21. I'm going to read it. Therefore, my beloved brothers, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and remaining wickedness, <laughs> and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Listen, when you come into the church, when you come into, into a meeting, into a devotional, into any time that you crack this book open, it's going to require a humility in me and in you. Whoever's cracking that book, whoever's listening to these words, you're gonna, there's going to have to be a meekness and a humility because it's going to confront us. And when there's no humbleness, there's no, when there's no humility and there's no meekness and there's pride, you'll think it's for someone else. And you won't receive. 
because you're like, man, I already heard this, I know this, I've preached this, I've done this, I've not, you're getting, you're, you'll get nothing. But there's a humility when a person comes in, and if you've been serving God for a long time, maybe you're a ministry leader, but you go into a meeting, listen, pastors are notorious. We go in somewhere, and we got a critical eye about everything going on around us. Come on, we visit other places, and we can't receive because we're critical, and we've, we've done it, we're doing it, we're this, we're that, and we miss God. Because it ain't about the person on the stage, and it ain't about the meeting, and it ain't about the denomination, and it's not about who did it and who's putting it on. It's about the engrafted Word of God that's able to penetrate me, separate me, and do something on the inside of me. And God forbid that we get, we're in the ministry and we lose ourselves and we don't receive. I need something. I need God. I need the Word of God, too. So, the first thing I want to talk about is, he says, I want you to be swift to hear. Swift to hear. I I titled it, Concentrate. So, he wants us to be swift, but not in a way of rushing for a response, but in a way of listening to understand. He wants us to be quick to approach situations, to hear it right, and to hear the heart of what's being said. Not, Not just be quick to hear it so that you can do something. But be quick to hear it so that you can understand it. So he says, I want you to be swift. I want you to be quick. I want you, uh, I want you to hear. Now, remember, I want, he wants us to be quick to hear. Now, you can hear noise. He, hearing can be two things. It can affect the senses, and it can affect the perception of something. There's two, so, right? so you can hear my voice, but you could not hear me. Are you following me? He's not talking about just the sense, the sense way of hearing. My, my wife loves the audio Bible. So I, I'm just going to confess, I am not an audio Bible guy. Because when I turn the audio on, I'll either fall asleep eventually or start barbecuing. <laughs> and I'm not, I hear it, but I ain't hearing it. Are you with me? Now, I know some of y'all, I'm not saying that audio is wrong. Some of y'all receive well from audio. My wife does. She'll hear an audio and then tell me everything she heard. I'll hear an audio and be like, I don't know. What, I'm not sure. Because I'm just, I don't know. She, I, was, I was raised before ADHD. So I, I could be, I don't know. But that, wasn't, that didn't exist when I was a kid. You know what they did? They sent me to the coach, and they ran me outside, and they paddled me. (laughs) Hey, I don't even want to get into that. Sorry, live stream. I just don't even want to get into that. (laughs) But if if that audio turns on, I'm drifting. I can't hear that way. I have to... I have to read it. I have to open my Bible to hear. So there's a hearing of the sound and a hearing in understanding of the message. One affects the senses and one affects the perceived things. There's also an intimacy to hearing. Jesus said, me and the Father are one. I only do what the Father says to do. How does he do it? Because he heard him. How did he hear him? Because he was intimate with his Father. So in order to hear, there's got to be an intimacy or else we just hear the words. Come on. Because one thing to hear about a problem is a whole other thing to show up at the problem. And, and you hear it with your eyes. <laughs> you hear it and you see it. Do, do you understand? There's an intimacy that happens. When you go overseas, that's why overseas missions hit you different. Because you can hear about those kids. But when you go down there and you touch them and you lay your hands on them. And you look into their eyes. It's a whole other level of hearing. Amen. Are you with me? And it changes you. It changes your life. And God is saying, I want you to hear Jesus. That was an intimacy. The Father and Jesus, he would, he would get up early to go pray. He would be alone with God a lot. In his, in, in, if you read the Bible, he would get up early and go into the mountain to go pray. There has to be that kind of an intimacy with us because we're supposed to be hearing, let me, let me tell you, quick to hear, but quick to hear what? 
quick to hear first the, the word of God. What are we supposed to be the, the word of God? You can't hear it if you're not listening to it. If you're not reading it, you're not going to hear it. Why, why, do we need to, why do we need to be quick to hear the word? We need to be quick to hear, to, to, to run to it, be willing to spend the time in it so that we can understand the heart of God. The Pharisees had a hard time understanding the heart of God. That's why they got on to him when he was healing on the Sabbath. Do you see what I'm saying? They were hearing, but they were hearing with their senses, with the law, and they weren't understanding the heart of Jesus. And that's what happens when we get into, like, religion. It becomes so, religion will make you so rigid that you can't hear the heart. So you're like, man, we shouldn't be doing this. We should be doing that. We should, because you're not hearing the heart. And God's heart, what is his heart? How do you know his heart? You got to be listening to him. You got to be in his word to know what is he saying? Why did he do that? What did he do? He, he, he listen, when Jesus hit the scene, he, he up, he like uprooted what they thought. They'd been going a certain kind of way. And then all of a sudden Jesus shows up and he goes, yeah, we got a different way. We read that, but that's a, that's a tough one. Swift to hear. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So the Bible says that all the scripture, every time, listen to me, this is so powerful but so simple. Every time we open the word, every single time, every word in here, every story in here has the power. It's, first of all, it's inspired by God and, and has a profitability to it. There's a profitability to this to teach you about it, to correct you, to reprove you, to reprove you. To give you instruction on what it is to live righteousness, righteously. Now, some people, listen, I want to talk about righteousness just real quick. Just a quick side note here. See, when you get saved, Jesus' righteousness is on. You have no, we have no righteousness of our own. When we come to Christ, he puts the robe of righteousness covers us, right? So he always shows up when we can't show up. But once you get saved and that righteousness and grace is given to you, that grace is not just unmerited favor. That grace is the power and strength to then for your life to transform into righteousness. <laughs> here, here, some of us, we're, we're, our righteousness, Christ's righteousness is his righteousness. But he, he wants to work through us that we get rid of some of our unrighteousness. Now, I know that even if I got rid of 80% of it, I wouldn't be righteous enough. I need his righteousness. Are you with me? But we can't throw out this idea of holiness and walking in holy. He said, be holy as I am holy. What does that mean? That means change, transform, allow the power of God and the knowing that he loves you to transform you. There should be, th listen, Christians, there should be things that we no longer do. They were unrighteous acts when we were young, but we came to Christ, and there should be things that we overcome. Are you all with me? And can I help? Listen, there's still things, more things we got to overcome. I'm not done. You know, the closer I get to God, the further I feel. Because <laughs> he's, because really when I really get, I mean, I had an idea of his holiness, but today I have another idea of his holiness. And I realize, oh, I need him so bad. Because some of the deep-rooted things that I'm trying to overcome in my life, like my pride and my ego and all those things that are deep-rooted on the inside, <sighs> I've got to, the Holy Spirit has to rip those things out of me. Amen. And I'm not there, but I'm going there. I want to be there. Yeah. 
Swift to hear. Everybody say, swift to hear. So we got to be swift to hear God's word, and then we've got to be swift to hear the words of people. I'm sorry, but a lot of, a lot of, a lot of Christians would say, man, this would be so much easier if we didn't have to deal with people. If it could just be me and God. Uh, we, and, and some of us want it to just be, hey, listen, it's just me and God. Well, sorry. First John, you just go read First John. He equates your love for him with your love for people. In First John, in the book of First John, he, the writer of that book equates your love for God with how you love people. In the, in the, in the cross, there's two beams. There's a vertical beam, which, which symbolize, I, I would say for me, it symbolizes my relationship to God, my vertical relationship to God individually by myself, and the horizontal beam is my relationship with you. He said, love your enemies. He says, how can you love, he says, how can you love how can you lo- say you love me, but you hate your brother and your sister? Right? That's what he says in the Bible. Don't, don't get mad at me. Go read your Bible. I'm just repeating it. You know, you know, you know it's because God is spirit. And you guys, you, we're flesh. So, like, I got to see you and talk to you. You rub me different. But God should rub us different too. When, when God's not rubbing you, it's because you're doing all the rubbing. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not allowing him. That word should rub you wrong. That rub should, uh, it should rub you right. That word should change you. But these people that are around you are really going to challenge you. Are y'all all right? This, I don't want to start a fight in here, but I'm just saying, it's tough because we gotta, when we have to deal with people, we got we to gotta overlook things, we got to overlook offense, and, and we got to forgive, and we've got to, and even if you didn't mean it, and you took it out of context, and all that stuff, and all of a sudden, you're having to like die to yourself, and what are you doing? You're, you're Romans 8, 9, and you're, you're being conformed to the image of Christ who died for us when he, it wasn't his fault. Some of y'all are like, I don't want to forgive him. It wasn't my fault. Yeah, that's what Jesus said. It, he could have said, it's not my fault, Father. They're the ones that have sinned. But he said, but not, I want to do what you want me to do, Lord. I want to be like you. I came for this purpose. So we got to hear the word of God and we got to hear people. Then we got to be slow to speak. Everybody say, slow to speak. I love this definition, slow, unhurried while still moving forward. (laughs) Unhurried, but still moving forward. In other words, you can't be in a hurry. You got to be slow. You got to be slow to disclose what's in your mind and what's in your thoughts. You know, there's another word that that came up here. It it was called to be circumspective. The word to, to be circumspect is to basically to look around, circumference, like the circumference of a circle. It's like before you speak, look around. Look about you. Get every angle. Before you start saying something that you just heard and got emotional over, stop and look around. Look around for what? For your motive. Why do you want to say what you're going to say? To be smarter than everyone? Why? Why Why, why do you want to say it? Is it going to build them up? Is it going to save them from something? So when you're circumspect, when you're slow, don't just be slow to be slow. Be slow and be intentional. So when you're slow, you're thinking, before I answer this question, what's my motive going to be when I I say it? what What is my heart like? What's my heart posture as I say this? Another thing you could look for is, how, how, how am I going to deliver this? Because some of our deliveries are just rough, guys. I just want to be honest. Me too. Some of us say things, it just, you might even be right. You just say it wrong. Uh, are you with me? 
If you're lost, you might be that person. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm kidding. But we, we should look at ourselves and say, like, am I slow to speak? Why do I want to say what I'm going to say? And how am I going to say it? Who am I speaking with here? You know, it, it, do, do, do I want to crush this person? Or do I want to lift this person up? Do I want to do I want to have do I want to have a continued relationship with this person where we can communicate back and forth or do I want to end it? What are you going to say and how are you going to say it? That's what it means to be circumspective before you say anything. You need to think. We must read the situation and respond wisely on how and when we should say something. I want you to hear this. Our speech is an indicator of who we are at our core. Let me say that again. Our speech, how we, what we say is an indicator of who we are at our core. Now, Matthew 12, this is Jesus speaking, it's in red. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Listen, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So when you say what you say, even if you just want to, even if you're like, hey, you don't tell me what to say, I'm going to say what I say, you will answer for what you say. And you won't answer to me, you don't have to answer to me. And you may not answer to the people you hurt, but you're going to answer to the king. Should, that, that, that right there should cause us to be slow, to slow down what we're about to say, and to really have a conviction with what we're going to say. The last one is slow to anger. So in the scripture, he says, uh, be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Anger, agitation of the soul, impulsive, emotional. Come on, don't raise your hand, but, you know, I just know. I, I, you know what I know? Can, can I, I will be very transparent with you today. I was very angry as a young guy, as a young man. And my wife paid the price for my, my anger because in my house, I almost created this environment where they had to, walk on eggshells to not get me upset. Not in, not, not in a physical abusive thing or anything, but just anger. It can be emotional and it can be, it's, it's it, you basically, listen, listen, man, listen to me. When you do that, you're, you're, you're bigger than them, physically. And we don't understand that when we carry that, that you might think like, man, I just raised my voice, but to them, there's fear that's instilled. And it's not a healthy fear. Are y'all with me? And that, that anger, that, that human anger, whatever it is, listen, God, God had, to make a, had to move on my heart to change that about me. Because I, I couldn't control it. It was a work of the Holy Spirit for him. But, but when I read, this, this, these are the scriptures that set me free. These are the scriptures that made me look at myself and say, I'm that. And that, that's true. I can tell you that it doesn't produce the righteousness of God because it didn't produce it in my life. My kids, because of my anger, they didn't run to God. They ran away from God. Huh? My marriage didn't get better because of my anger. It got worse because of my anger. Are you all with me? We, if, we, if we can't be transparent in the church, no, nothing will ever change. Nothing will change. And this idea that everybody's got it going on, <laughs> Jesus had to come because we don't got it going on. Do you understand? Like he had to come because we don't have it going on. You can, you can dress up nice. You can talk the talk. You can walk. You can, you can talk the talk. You can get all the gear. Come on. 
I used to, I used to joke about playing golf. I, I used to have like all the cool golf stuff. I had really expensive golf shoes with the little, uh, what do you call it? I don't, you see, I don't even play golf. I had clubs. I had King Cobra clubs back in the day. Those were like the mo- one of the most expensive set of clubs. And man, when I'd walk on that golf course and I'd show up, you know, all decked out with the King Cobras, everybody would be like, whoa, this dude must be good. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I was always so embarrassed. You know, everybody gets that seven o'clock. I play with guys that wanted the early tea time. So if you get the early tea time, then you got a crowd watching you just to add to the pressure that you're not good. <laughs> Come on. And I'm up there. I, I even watched, like, you know. <laughs> I even had the moves down, and it even gave you the impression, like, this dude must know what he's doing. And then I'd swing and bloop. <laughs> Go to the women's tee box. And everybody would be like, oh, man. You know, unfortunately, for some Christian, that's their walk. <laughs> that's the walk. We're dressed up. We got the gear. You got your life. You got that study Bible that's like that thick. <laughs> you even write in it and highlight in it. But you don't do it. Because we don't get out there and do it and do it and do it and get better and get better and get better. And we struggle with anger. We're not quick to listen because we're not listening. You can't be quick to, you can't be slow to speak till you're quick to listen. And you can't be slow to anger till you're listening and talking slower. Because the anger is just the manifestation of you jumping the gun with your mouth. That's all. Slowing the, the slow to anger part is just the manifestation of you running the mouth because you got emotional or because I got emotional. I don't mean to be you. Yeah, I'm talking to me. This was hard to hear for me. The Bible says a man without, uh, uh, he who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down without walls. Proverbs 25, 28. In the old days, they would build a city, and they would build a wall all the way around the city that was thick and tall, and it was for the defense of that city so that invaders wouldn't be able to just invade that city. And the Bible says that when we don't control our spirit, our emotion, our anger, we are like a city with no defense mechanism. So the devil comes in and he has his way with our families and with our marriages and with our churches because we have no self-control. So as Christians, we have to learn to say, I'm going to be slow to anger. I, listen, the Bible doesn't even say to not be angry. It says to not let the sun go down on your anger. There's two different kinds of anger. There's the anger of man, the fleshly anger that's because you're embarrassed or you're fearful. And then there's the righteous anger of God that says, that's not happening in my neighborhood. That says, that's not going to happen on my watch. It's the anger of God that, 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 that stirs you up to, to put boundaries in place for your children and their, and their electronics. The devil ain't telling you to put boundaries on their electronics. He's telling you to leave them alone. So we have to have our defenses, and our defenses is, comes to our self-control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Do you see how this is not just a matter of will? It's not a matter of just your will. It's a matter of receiving Christ and receiving His Spirit and His Spirit producing a fruit. Joy, peace, kindness, self-control. Those things come from hearing, being quick to be in relationship with him. Three major pitfalls that lead us into unrighteous anger. Listen, listen to this. Uh, imperfect judgment. Listen, most of the time when we judge, we're imperfect in our judgment. 
We've got to pay attention. We've got to, we got to let God do the judging. Because when we start to, in, to judge things imperfectly, you know, I've had situations where people have come to me and they're like, hey, listen, I'm really upset with this person over here. I came to the event and they looked at me and they looked right through me. And they always say hi to me and they didn't say hi to me. And, and, and I'm just really offended and I don't know what I did. And uh, Are you all with me? But the thing is, because I'm the pastor, I know what that person is going through right now. And I'm sitting here going like, hey, listen, I know you feel that way, but listen, there's just things I can't tell you, but just give her some grace. She just found something out. <laughs> She's going through something, right? She's got something going on in her marriage. She's got something going on with her kids. She's got something going on in her body with her health. And right now, she's just going through it. Can we have grace and not just imperfectly judge a fellow brother or sister that's going through something? We can't wear our, our feelings on our shirt sleeves. You know, we're always walking around like, man, did you see how they looked at me? Did you? And then you, you're over there. You go home and you stew that thing. You stir that thing up and you get your pot out. And man, she looked at me this way. And then pretty soon, she ain't even looking at you, but you're seeing like she's looking. You like make it bigger than what it is. You like, and all of a sudden, man, you're full out of angry at somebody. And they're like, man, what happened? I just had a bad day. Imperfect. We, we get, and if, we, if we fall into those traps, we have this imperfect judgment. It leads us to get angry. It leads us, it, when we have a wrong motive, we get angry. Y'all ever had an immature child? Uh, and everything has to go their way because everything is for me. Are you with me? And our motive begins to be like, well, I want to do this, and nobody's letting me do it. So I'm mad. <laughs> and you get into this unrighteous anger, you start sabotaging things because, well, if they're not going to do what I want to do, then I'm not going to do what they want to do. Are you all with me? I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm just, I'm pulling back the curtains. So we can see the stuff that goes on on the inside of us, because we're all guilty of this. And then the other one is sinful reactions. When we judge imperfectly, when we have wrong motives, and when we have sinful reactions. Sinful reactions. So church, let me ask you, are we, are, are we swift to hear? Now, I, I, listen to me. T today, I'm, I'm about to end. Look, please do not take what I'm saying because I do use the word you and all that. I, I really don't mean that in the sense of accusing you. I hope you don't feel accused in here today because, you know, I've had to read this all week. God's been on my case, my case all week. And I, what, what I just know is that if he's on my case, then he's going to pa pass it on to y'all. Because I'm the pastor, and that's what he's given me to preach. And then I'm like, do I really got to preach this? That means I got to align all these things. I got to go back and figure out, man, am I quick to listen? He exposed some things on my quickness to listen, on my time of intimacy with him. I was telling my wife, just these, this, these past few days, I've just had this heaviness on me. Just, I've just been... Uh, I want Jesus to come back. Amen. <laughs> I mean, but that's not that. You're, yeah, it's good. It's good, but I want him to come back because I don't want to do it anymore. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, it's like, not, it's good, but it's not good. Like, it's like the wrong motive. That's like, oh, I don't want another, I don't want another meeting. Like, I just, come back, Lord. <laughs> rapture us, whatever, whatever's coming, whether it's the rapture or the post trip, whatever, just come. I'll take it. And you know, I'm sitting there feeling sorry for myself, and I go, oh, I'm feeling this way. My wife's, 
She's been with, we've been together 33 years, so she just looks at me and she already knows. She'll just like walk up, be like, oh. And then she, t- she always says the right thing at the wrong time, you know? It's, she'll be like, you need to pray. <laughs> And you know what the Lord said? She's right. You have no, you, you've, you've drifted from your intimacy. So when you drift from me, then the weight of all this stuff that I've been carrying for you, I've been carrying everything for you. The problem is I'm not moving. You're getting out from under me. I, I'm not moving. You're getting out for a moment. You're right. You can't do this. You couldn't do this when we started. Come on, man. Some of y'all were here when I first started preaching. It was bad. It was rough. Y'all endured it. Thank you for enduring me. There was a time, if you're here, there was a time when I did worship. I I had a guitar. I did worship in here. And I'd put it down, and then I'd do the announcements. There was no video, because I had no videographer. And then I'd get up and be like, okay, everybody sit down. We're going to preach the word. Then I took up an offering. And then there was just a time when it was just me. It was, it was rough. But the whole time God was holding me, he, he, he made it to, 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 to where we're even at today. I'll just share this with you. I know this is my thing, but I share my thing because you might have your thing that's kind of similar. It's like if you're feeling weight, Maybe you moved. Because he said he'd never leave nor forsake. Right? He said, I'm with you. He said, when, when I died for you and I gave you my grace and mercy and saved you, I did it for, till eternity. Like, I never said, if you do something wrong, I'm going to take it from you. <laughs> so he's with me, for me, all the time. So if I'm feeling weight and it's... It, you know, I always say, joke around about that. You know, it's, you got the God of the universe who's perfect in all his ways, and you've got Robert. If something's wrong, it's probably not him. Perfect in all his ways, knows the beginning from the end, Alpha and Omega. It must be Robert. But we have a hard time coming to grips that, like, hey, Robert, you're off. I know you're doing great, and you're doing great things, but you're off. Maybe today you're feeling off. Stand to your feet with me. Here are some upcoming events we would like to share with you. He and Me, a fun-filled camp day where our young ones from ages 6 to 10 will learn about their true identity in Christ. On September 21st from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Sign them up at phckady.com. Thinking about getting baptized? This is your opportunity to do so. Join us September 22nd at 10.30 a.m. for Baptism Sunday. Sign up at phckady.com. Ladies, encounter God like never before. Experience freedom, healing, peace, and more. Join us on September 27th through September 29th for our Women's Encounter. Register at phckady.com. An exciting Sunday is coming up. On October 6th, Bill Weiss, author of 23 Minutes in Hell, will be our guest speaker during both our 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. services. This is going to be a powerful time and you won't want to miss it. Be sure to invite your friends and family as we gather together for an incredible message. Men, mark your calendars for a day of encouragement and growth. On October 19th, we're hosting the Gathering of Champions, a powerful event for men of all ages. Join us as we come together to learn what it truly means to be a man of God. Sign up at phckady.com.